Good morning again. We are in the second week of Grateful Heart, really talking about what it means to be, have a grateful heart. And I challenged you at the end of last week, if you were here, if you were joining us last week. Uh, if not, I challenged everybody last week to write a sentence. Uh, and, and in that sentence, include five things that you were grateful for. And uh, I just wanted to know, I don't know if you've done that, but I did that uh, this week. And one of the things that I was grateful for this week is I'm grateful that my son has kind of harebrained weird interests at times. And uh, I love that about him. He'll just come up with something different new every, every week. He comes up with something different maybe. And I love that because here's why. Uh, we, about a week or so ago, uh, we were, uh, I had not closed the pool. Uh, I don't know if we thought we were going to do some late November swimming. but <laughs> We do not have a heater. But we had left the pool open. And so we have a pool at our house. And I, we were going to close the pool, put a tarp on that. It consists of you know, all this stuff that has to happen. I have to take the diving board off. And I have to take the pool and all that stuff. And so last uh, week or so, I was actually out there. It was pretty cold. And uh, took the diving board off. There's a, two bolts that are on the back side of the diving board that you take off. And then you can remove the diving board and, and, and then uh, get everything tucked away. And so as I did that, I took that off. And after I got the two bolts out of the diving board, I, uh, one of my extensions from my ratchets rolled into the deep end of the pool. And so I thought, well, you know what? It's no big deal. I've got a net on a pole. I'll fish that baby out of there and it'll all be good. But in the moment from doing that to walking over to get the net to coming back to the pool to get that thing out of the bottom of the pool, I didn't realize that uh, I, for, I, it, my memory had left that I'd taken the bolts out of the back of the diving board. You know where this is going, right? To get a good view, you want to walk out on the end of that thing and, and take a good look. And so that's exactly what I did. I got on the diving board and walked to the very end. And as you can imagine, I had everything on the diving board, tools, my DeWalt drill. I had a whole like box of sockets, uh, wrenches, everything. And when I stepped out on that diving board, I wish so badly somebody would have recorded it because I would have went viral. I mean, that my feet went... That, the back, it was like a teeter-totter, and that, back, that diving board just went whoop, and all of my tools, everything, including myself, went into the deep end of the pool, and let me just tell you, talk about a polar plunge. I was like, <laughs> it's one of those, and, and I got out, I was just dying laughing at myself. I cannot believe that I was that dumb that I actually did that, and so then here's where it comes in. Here's the grateful part comes in, because at this moment, everything that I owned from a tool perspective, my drills, my my phone, I got my phone in back pocket. Everything was at the bottom of the pool on the deep end. Now, I had wanted, I knew, there was no way I was scooping all that stuff up with a net. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have to get the wetsuit and get in this pool that was like, now I heard like these ice bath challenge and stuff are supposed to be good for you. I'm not about it. I wasn't about it. So I remember that once upon a time, Caden had been watching TikToks and got into magnet fishing. And so I was grateful that Caden had his little magnet fishing deal, so I was able to actually not have to get into the pool. So that's just something I was grateful for. So I'd share that story with you. There's always something that we, but I so wish somebody would have caught that on video because it really would have been uh, funny to watch. I would have loved to show it to you. But we're talking about what it means to be a, have a grateful heart, what that looks like, what you're grateful for. We talked last week uh, uh, in, in conjunction with our Be Rich campaign. The Be Rich is uh, something that we do. The Bible tells us in Timothy to be rich in good deeds and to be uh, do good things with our money. Uh, so we challenged you last week to give a one-time gift of $39.95. If you've done that, great. If you haven't had an opportunity or not able to, that's okay. We just encourage you to try to give a one-time gift of $39. If you're, if you're blessed and, and able to do more than that, we'd love that. We're going to actually give all of that money back away to organizations within our community that are doing a great job. So we're grateful for that. We're in the second week. I asked you last week, uh, we talked about giving and how a grateful heart really leads to generosity. And so I asked you to write something down. Did anybody do that? I'm not, you don't have to raise your hand because I know you are because I know some of you probably didn't do it, right? Like you didn't write anything down. You didn't go home and go, man, Trent told me to write something down. I'm going to write something down. Uh, I know you don't. Some of you did. Some of you probably didn't. Uh, if you did, I appreciate that. If you didn't, maybe it was because you didn't have anything to write on. So today, when you leave, 
we are going to give you a journal, okay? So as you leave today, grab one of these things. It's just grateful at grace. There's absolutely nothing in the middle of it. You can write whatever you want to. Take some notes, draw some pictures, whatever you want to do. But we're going to give you one of these on your way out uh, because we know that we have to cultivate this heart of gratitude. And there are a lot of things that can affect our level of gratitude in our heart. And in the words, I got this band wrong in the first, in the first um, service, but in, in, in the words of... Uh, 80s hairband Cinderella, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And so I challenged you last week to count your blessings and to start naming those. And I read a quote this week. It says, contentment is the reward of gratitude. And so I'm just, I think that we can learn to be more content. We, we learn to be more content if we're more, uh, if, we, if we exercise more gratitude in our heart. So we don't, I asked you last week, you don't want to be that one person that's ungrateful. And I know that we don't want to be that. Ungratefulness is not an attractive trait. And there are a couple other things that are really not attractive traits. And those two things are two words that we hear about a lot in our culture, and that is privilege and entitlement. Have you heard those words lately? <laughs> uh, you hear a lot about that on social media and in our news media and all that. It's privilege and entitlement. And so, um, uh, entitled people. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever run across somebody that's super entitled? They just feel like they're, they're better than everybody else or they're just on a different level. You know, a uh, perfect example is like on the construction going to Mount Vernon, you know, everybody has to merge in, in the one lane uh, going down there now. And then you have this, everybody starts to get over, but then you have this one guy that just zooms on the outside, right? Like he's better than the rest of us. And, and like, I'm really bad. Like I, I, I have been that person, I'll admit. Not, I'm not ashamed. I, I'm ashamed to say that I have been that person. I'm not proud of it, but I'm getting better. And so now, I now I'm just petty, and I will not let those people in. So just so you know, uh, but those people are just entitled. You know, they feel like they have to zoom up there, and they feel like they're going to get like, why are you more important than the rest of us? And there's just these certain people that have this air about them uh, that are important. And I don't know if you've ever been around somebody like that, or you've ever had an opportunity uh, to be around important people. Um, when I was at the bank once, I. Uh, I worked at the Bank of America for 23 years, and when I was at the bank, we had a, a, a manager's meeting in St. Louis, and I was at the tower, and all the managers were there, and um, Ken Lewis, who was actually at the time the CEO of Bank of America, he's kind of a big deal, flew in on his private jet and, you know, made a cameo appearance at our manager meeting, and so it was a big deal, like, the, you know, he was like a corporate royalty, and so, you know, you're, you're expected to behave a certain way around corporate royalty when you work for the bank, and that type of thing. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that, but uh, I had this opportunity. And so Ken Lewis is at our meeting. He did his little cameo speech. And then we were all to go to this United Way benefit down in the atrium of, of the Bank of America Plaza, downtown St. Louis. And so everybody was leaving the meeting and getting on elevators. The elevators were full uh, of, of managers and executives and people getting on. And, and, and I got on the elevator. I was one of the last ones to get on the elevator. And one of my friends that was managed another bank was there and his, he had a briefcase. And as I backed in the elevator, his briefcase hit me in the hind end. And I just simply said, whoa, Dennis, easy there. I got my Christmas goose early, right? So I, I thought it was funny. Uh, I think Ken Lewis thought it was funny because he was in the back of the elevator. HR, not so much. They did not appreciate that. <laughs> Human resources, I got a call the next day. Yeah, that was probably not appropriate. But there's this, like, there's this air about people or they feel privileged or they feel like there's somebody special. And I was like, he puts his pants on the same way I do. But it's probably why I don't work at the bank anymore. Anyway, um, um, but there are these two words, privilege and entitlement, and I kind of want to look at them. Privilege means having an advantage that is out of your control that you did not ask for. That is the definition of privilege, is that we have this advantage to, that, we, that we did not ask for that's just ours. And then entitlement means believing oneself to be inherently deserving of privileges. Two different things. One is that we have privilege. And so the fact of the matter is, if you're sitting here this morning and you live in in the United States of America, you have privilege. I don't care who you are. If you live in this country, we are privileged people in this world. Every single one of us. Every single one of us are privileged. We didn't ask to be born here. It was out of our control. We just happened to be born in America. And we live with this privilege. So that's an example of privilege. Entitlement is something completely different. That means that you believe that you are inherently deserving of something. 
Like you deserve something special because of who you are or where you are at in society or the job you have or whatever, you, whatever you've been blessed with. And so we live in this entitlement culture and we hear about that all the time, right? Well, that's my right. I want, this is for me. This is what, I deserve this. I, this, I, I should have this, right? And so there's this entitlement culture that we live in and church is probably the last place that you would expect to see that. However, <laughs> Let me tell you, it's not. We as a church and as church people, and I was talking to somebody about this after the first service, we naturally drift inward. Churches naturally drift inward. In other words, their focus becomes inward focused. It becomes focused on what I want, what I like. Well, I don't like that we church. Well, I, don't, I don't want to do that. And we become this, cons- there's this consumerism in the American church that has become so prevalent that it's like, if you don't like something, you go, and you have this shuffling of people because we become laser focused. It tends to be selfish. We become entitled to what we, you know, what happens. And it's just, it will quickly just become about us if we don't consistently fight against it. And so um, it's, it's about Jesus. It's about his kingdom. It's about his mission to love God, love our neighbor, and make disciples. That is what we exist for. That's why we gather here in this place. It's why you are here. And uh, if we don't keep that front and center, uh, our church will become something that we don't want it to be. And so I read a quote this week. It's from Brene Brown, and she said, what separates privilege from entitlement is generosity, is gratitude, actually. What separates privilege from entitlement is gratitude. When you begin to take this privilege that we have, and what keeps us from being these entitled people is the gratitude that we have in our heart and gratitude that we're able to express about what we've been given and that we recognize that and we cultivate that. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to share a couple of stories uh, in, in passage in Philippians chapter 2. And, and Paul wrote this letter to this church in Philippi that he planted. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, here's what he taught. And he was basically telling this church in Philippi what he knew of Jesus. Here's what, here's what I know of Jesus. Here's what I've come to know because I, I've, I, I ran around with his disciples. I've talked to people that knew Jesus. I, I knew Jesus. I know Jesus' brother. I, Paul was like, I've been around people that knew Jesus. And so here's, and what's interesting about Paul, he wrote most of the New Testament, but what most people don't realize is that he wasn't a disciple. He, he wasn't part of the Jesus game when Jesus was on earth. He didn't have his conversion until Jesus died and was crucified and resurrected, and then Paul became a believer. So he's much like us. And so he had this moment where he was talking to this church at Philippi, and he said, here's what I know about Jesus. Here's what I believe about Jesus. Here's what I know to be true. And this is what he said in verse 6. Though he was God, I'm just going to let that settle there for a minute. Even though he was God, Jesus was God, that's what Paul is saying, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, Jesus is like, yeah, but it's really not that big of a deal. I'm not clinging to that. I'm not going to exercise that authority here. Though he was God, boom, privilege. Jesus had privilege. He was born as the Son of God. It was out of his control. Maybe. Actually, it was. If you read the Bible, he chose to come. Anyway. We'll get into that later. It's a theology thing. Jesus was one of those who, if Jesus was the only one who has ever really truly been entitled, he was born the Son of God. He had privilege on this earth, but the difference was he recognized his privilege. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Verse 7, here's what Paul says in the next verse. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. Gave it up. People are like, hey, you're son of God? Yeah, I know. I'm going to give that up. He wasn't walking in going, well, hey, I'm Jesus, so everybody wait on me. He gave that up. 
Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Rather than coming the first time, the first time Jesus is going to walk, he walked on this earth, he was a real person, whether you've made that choice to believe that or not, not many people will debate the fact that he was a real person. It really just comes down to the question of who do you think he was. If we are a follower of Jesus Christ, we tend to believe that he exactly who he said he was, and that was the Son of God, and that he died and rose again and was resurrected, right? That's what separates us. So here's the thing. Rather, than he, he came the first time he came, which we're going to celebrate here in a few weeks about Christmas. The whole reason why we celebrate Christmas is because Jesus came as a human being, and the reason he came the first time as a savior. He came, hey, I'm going to be a little baby. I'm going to come in, I'm a, I'm going to come in a humble start. I was born in a stable with animals. The first people that came to visit me were shepherds who were the lowest of the economic class, the lowest of the lows. He came as a humble person and, and, and he came as a servant. But when he comes back, let me tell you, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a different Jesus. He's going, to come as, he's going to come as a king and a ruler, and he will rule. But that's not how he came the first time. The first time he came, he gave up his privileges. He took a humble position as a slave and was born as a human being. And so last week, I asked you a question. What are the chances that we are ungrateful? What are the, what are the chances that we are those ungrateful people that when you look and see somebody that's ungrateful, you're like, oh man, what a, what a waste. What are the chances that we've become ungrateful? What are the chances that we've become ungrateful as believers of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and what he has given us and what, what we have access to? Probably pretty high. My question to you is a two-part question this week, and it's this. <laughs> First part is, do you recognize your privilege? Jesus recognized his, and he gave it up. Do you recognize your privilege? And if so, what are you doing with it? I'm just going to let that sit there for a minute. Do you recognize your privilege? And if so, what are you doing? Do we recognize that we are privileged? Do we recognize, if, if so, what are we doing with it? And then maybe another question is, what do, we, what do you feel like you're entitled to on this earth? Happiness? Your time? Well, that's my time. I, so I have to, I, I'm entitled to the rest. I'm entitled to the rest. Your money, your effort, your health? What are you entitled to? Are you entitled to... <laughs> I'm going to touch on that come to church and bring your kids and drop them off in the children's area and then never serve back there? Just let somebody serve you? Yeah, it's all about, I just want to serve me. Here I am, serve me. What are you doing with your privilege and how are you serving? Now, that's a hard message. It's a hard message for me. But if we're going to follow Jesus, you think Jesus was ever tired? Pretty sure he was. What are you doing? The heading that this scripture is listed in that I'm preaching from this morning is in Philippians chapter 2. And the heading in my Bible, there's a big bold heading at the top of chapter 2 in Philippians. And it says this, having the attitude of Christ. Really, another way to translate that or interpret that would be having the heart of Christ. Do we have a heart of gratitude for what God has done for us? And does that gratitude equate into our generosity and our service? Because it did for Jesus. I have a question that I, another question I like to throw around my house a lot. It's, a, it's an easy question. Um, I ask my family and friends sometimes that come over. Um, I'll just toss this question out. And here's the question. The question is, hey, anybody want to rub my feet? <laughs> I have no takers. <laughs> and uh, in 30 years of marriage, I think Cheryl has taken me up on that once, you know. And I don't blame her, right? Like, I'm not a feet person. It's one of 150,000 reasons why I don't like water parks, right? They're just gross. They stink. They smell. They, uh, you know, there's stuff under your toenails that need to be dug out. And, I, you know, it's just weird. I just hate feet. And so um, when you think, and I know you know this story, but I'm going to share a story with you about Jesus, 
And Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And some of you know that story. It's found in John chapter 13. And here's the first verse. And I think so many times you get into the story, but you miss the first part of this verse, the first part of the story. And it's in chapter 13, verse 1. And the verse 1 of this story starts like this. Before the Passover celebration, and this kind of sets the scene (laughs) for what we see unfold here. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. In other words, he began to think about, hey, it's getting close. I'm going to have to walk a really difficult walk. I'm going to have to carry the weight of the world, literally, in the form of a Roman cross on my shoulders. My time is coming. And in that moment, we see the selflessness of Jesus. Because you know what he's thinking about? He's thinking about these 12 guys that are in the room that are going to be left here after he's gone. One of which he knew would betray him. One of these guys he knew was going to turn him in and betray him. One of these guys was an enemy. And yet Jesus' heart was grateful for them. He loved them. It says here in the last part of that verse, he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Because you know why? Because true leaders serve. It's what they do. Jesus, verse 3, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and that he would return to God. Jesus knew his position. He knew his privilege. He knew his role. He knew that he was going to be the man. He knew that God had given him authority over absolutely everything. Can you imagine that kind of power? God has given me power over everything. I can do anything. I could say anything. I can do it. I have the power. Jesus said in that verse, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and he had come from God and would return to God. So what does he do knowing that? (laughs) Verse 4. So he got up from the table, and he took off his robe, and he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around them. I mean, talk about a dirty job. He stoops down to do the most menial of jobs there was in society. A guy that had all of the power, all authority of heaven and earth. He recognized his privilege, but he did something with it. Jesus showed us what it was like to be true leaders. And we have this image of God that he's sacred and holy and he deserves and he deserves respect and he is all that. He certainly deserves all those things. But he doesn't feel entitled to it. Couldn't get his head wrapped around and Peter couldn't get his head wrapped around that. When verse six it says, When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. And Peter said, no way. No, Peter protested. You will never wash my feet. Peter's like, that ain't going to happen, Jesus. You're not washing my feet. Because Peter knew who he was. He should have known this. Peter should have known because it wasn't the first time that Jesus brought dignity to those who were considered less than. 
He spoke in public with a Samaritan woman at the well. A Roman centurion asking to stop and heal a servant. He graced the home of Zacchaeus and instigated a sinner dinner at Matthew's house. He invited children to interrupt him when he spoke. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He ate with Pharisees who were the super entitled. And on one occasion, there was a prostitute that crawled onto the porch and began wiping his feet with her tears and her perfume. See, Jesus was about other people. He was about serving. To follow Jesus, we have to allow him to serve us. Jesus replied to Peter, and he said, Unless I wash your feet, you don't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just me, not just my feet. You see, when we came to the realization that Jesus came to serve us, it's overwhelming. And we're like, yeah, just do it all. I need more of you, Jesus. So my question to you this morning as we wrap up the end of this service, and um, how many feet have you washed from your position of privilege this year? How many feet have you washed from your position of privilege this year? Just a question. And so uh, some of you do a lot, and I know we have a lot of people in this church that do, and I'm grateful for that. And so uh, we have this year at Be Rich. We've done it for the last four or five years, and it's, it's, it, the intensity is focused on gratitude. And um, church is funny to me sometimes because you all get up and you come and you get dressed and you get in your cars and you drive here for whatever reason. You know, some some weeks you make a decision to come, and some weeks you watch online and whatever, and then, and then we sing songs, and I stand up here and talk and try to convince you guys to do something. You know, it's kind of what churches boil down to. The fact of the matter is, it's, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about a grateful heart. It's a heart thing. It's not a church thing. And so, uh, that should spill over into church thing, and it does. And so we have a couple, uh, every year we do this Be Rich, and so this week we're on Serve. And so we've been highlighting some of the organizations that, that we are going to serve this year through your generosity and through our generosity as a church body together. Um, Matea shared, you know, about the Dream Center last week, and this week I want to I highlight just a couple of other uh, uh, organizations that are doing great work that we, sh- that we will, uh, uh, will benefit from this Be Rich. And so I'm going to ask Dave Luce to come up, and I'm going to ask Angie Courtright to come up. I don't know if we have a microphone. Savannah's has got a microphone for you guys. As they're coming up, there's a couple of organizations that, and, and uh, we have people that are doing some really, 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 really great work. We have people that are washing people's feet out of the privilege. Um, and, it, and it comes, and I know, I know it takes a little bit of everything. We're the body of Christ, so it takes the hands and the feet, and we're not all the hands. We're not all, we're not all the people that can uh, build a deck or a bed, but we are people that can support it. And so, uh, Dave, I'm going to start with you, Dave. I know that you're a part of an organization called Sleep in Heavenly Peace, mm-hmm. and so I would just like for you just to take a few minutes. Uh, we're going to show some pictures up on here as you're talking, but just, uh, just take a few minutes and walk us through what Sleep in Heavenly Peace is all about. Good morning. Yes, I am blessed to be a part of this organization, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. We are in our third full year now, and in that three years, we are knocking at the door of 900 beds built. To date, we have 878, and we have delivered 735 beds to children who did not have anywhere to sleep. Um, Sometimes that's hard for us to fathom. But think about this, on your way home today, you will most likely drive by a home where there is a child that does not have a place that he or she can call their own to sleep in, and they are so thrilled when they get this bed. I mean, the the pictures, the faces, there is a complete bed, and this is the way that it is when we leave the home. We go in, we put the bed together on site, and then we also give the bedding, so it's a complete uh, set when we leave, and they are just thrilled. Most of them cannot wait to get in it. They're usually in it before we leave, and um, we have a Facebook page uh, that can tell you more about us. Uh, We also have a link on there that if you know someone 
who is in need of a bed, you can direct them to that page. There's a link. All they got to do is click on it. it. Takes them to the website, the national website. And as soon as they fill that out and put in their, their zip code, it comes over an app to us, and we are notified about that need. We serve all of Mount Vernon, Centralia, Salem area, and all of the little towns in between. Uh, we will go anywhere. We have one more build coming up this year. Actually, we're going to Greenville uh, on December 3rd. Uh, they're sponsoring a build up there, and that will take us over our 900. That's awesome. And Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah. I uh, just, it's just in one of the organizations that we're going to be supporting through Be Rich and through your generosity, but it's also an incredible way for you to serve um, if you want to show up, right? You can. When we do our builds, you do not have to be skilled. We <laughs> take people who have never had a tool in their hand in their life, and we've got it set up. Actually, it's, it's quite a production. It's an assembly line, and we can build 50 beds, usually in under four hours. Sounds great. And that is completely ready to go and to be put together. Uh, another way you can serve, and in, in not only in giving, we had after the first service, uh, someone that had went out and purchased the bed in a bag, and they gave us 12 of those. Awesome. Um, and that just goes a long way. What we try to do, it, you know, if we got a little guy that loves superheroes, and if we can give him a Superman or a Spider-Man bedding, and, you know, or a little girl princess thing, it just, it helps. So if you see those and you want to uh, give in that way, if you're in Walmart, and I noticed the other day, we went in Walmart, and they had those on clearance. We were going to buy a bunch of them. They were already all gone. <laughs> and I think we were a recipient of those today. That's awesome. Yes. I love it. Uh, yeah, and uh, just a caveat, if you send your kids to volunteer, they will actually teach them how to make a bed. No, maybe not. Maybe not. Well. I need to send my kids. But uh, anyway, Angie, I know Angie, you guys see Angie, uh, uh, we asked Randy, Randy Donahoe, if you know Randy, uh, it attends our church, Randy's sick today, so continue to pray for him, but uh, Randy wasn't able to join us, but Angie has got the, the last minute call to give us, tell us a little bit about Mission Salem, Angie. Yes, I wish Randy could be here, yeah. because um, if there is a model of a servant, it, it's Randy. Absolutely. Uh, so everyone that came in today, uh, if you walked in here you're in church, you need to go home and in your gratitude journal, <laughs> write that down. Absolutely. Uh, so many of our neighbors are not in church today because getting in and out of their house is um, too big of an inconvenience. I mean, it, it's difficult. Some of our neighbors are even basically trapped in their own homes. And that's where Mission Salem comes in, involved. We... Uh, build wheelchair ramps. We also modify steps and add handrails for anyone with a mobility issue. As a matter of fact, this year we uh, stepped out and we provided a CNI dog for a gentleman. Uh, that's something yeah. we've never done before. Um, it, but w we just want to make sure that everyone in our community has safe access in and out of their home. And many times for these individuals, that's out to medical treatments. And we work solely on volunteers. This is our fourth year as Mission Salem. We were doing similar projects here around the church every year through our men's program and through Youth Invasion. And now we're, we're able to branch out and make it a community project. But um, we normally average 25 ramps a year. And this week, um, we will complete number 37 Ooh. for 2022. Awesome. So uh, what we need the most are volunteers. <laughs> and, and like Dave said, um, likewise for us, you don't need skill, you don't need tools, <laughs> and you don't need prior experience. We'll, we'll take care of all that when you get there. That's awesome. Thank you, Angie. I know, Mr. Salem, you hear about that a lot. They do such great work. I know that it's, it, it often bleeds over into more things than just ramps and, and that type of thing, but you guys are always grateful for that. And I, just wanted to get, I just wanted to highlight a couple of those things. When you give through Be Rich, uh, these are the organizations that you're supporting. And the other thing that I would just point out, you know, some of these organizations, 
uh, this wasn't like the church got, had a board meeting and the board got together and said, hey, let's do this. Uh, this sounds like a great idea. It was actually individual people. It was, some, it was somebody that had a vision. It was one person that said, hey, I think this is something that I could lead or that I could do. And it has grown into these organizations that we're able to support. So if God has placed something on your heart, if there's a way that you can, uh, this is what washing feet looks like in 2022. Uh, and so we have that opportunity. I'll leave you with this verse this morning. It says, Philippians 2, 3 through 4, it says, don't be, shelf, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. And so that is my challenge for you this week. Take it, when, you, when you leave this place, get your grateful book. Think about your privilege and think about how you are using it. Thank you so much if you're doing that already. Thank you, and you're serving, and I know many of you are. We're just grateful for that. Stand with, you, stand with me this morning. I want to pray with you before we leave. Uh, uh, as you head out, grab your book and, and write down what you're th- grateful for. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for these organizations. Thank you for the leadership, and thank you for uh, the people that, you have, uh, that, that, have, that you've raised up to lead these organizations and to, and, and to put actually manpower behind a vision or a thought or an idea. But Father, I just pray that you would continue to make us grateful. Give us a grateful heart that leads to our generosity, that leads to our service of others in our community. Help us to look for those ways that we can serve. Help us to recognize our privilege and understand what we can do and what you would have us to do. Uh, Recognize, Father, that we are all the body of Christ, and we may not all do the same thing or have all the same skill set, but there is something that we each one of us can do, and we're grateful for that. Father, I pray that you would guide us, uh, direct us, help us to Help those that are less fortunate as we go and celebrate Thanksgiving this week with our families and our friends. Lord, help us to truly, truly have a grateful heart. In your precious holy name I pray. Thank you for being here this morning. If you're on your way out, I will notice there's a grateful wall and a prayer wall. Feel free to jot down something you're grateful for. We do not have to tear down chairs today, so go and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for a great, being a great church.